Can you hear me back there? Yeah? OK. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So it is my pleasure to um, have Professor Karen Tolley here with us today. She is from Penn State University from their mechanical engineering department. Um, she is currently a distinguished professor in that department. She's formerly their department head, and I think you were that position for 10 years. 15. 15. Whoa. <laughs> I've been chair for five, so. Whoa. All right. Okay, so anyway, her research is on, uh, focused on heat transfer, additive manufacturing, and instrumentation. She does quite a bit of work on um, turbine blade design and manufacturing, which I think is super cool. And she's going to talk about um, <coughs> developing gas turbine engines and reducing the carbon footprint, kind of that intersection today, which I think is fantastic. I, she does all kinds of service work. We're on a board together. Um, Oh, I should, I should tell you where your degrees came from. So you got your bachelor's and master's from University of Illinois and your PhD from University of Texas. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to you because really right. that's the interesting part. Okay, thank you, Christy. And I, I want to just thank everybody here who I met with a number of people today. I just had a fantastic day. This was my really first visit to your beautiful campus. I know everybody apologized for the rain, but I think that's like part of the character. And so I really did enjoy it. It, it was, it's absolutely a beautiful, you should be very proud of being a student or a faculty on this campus because it, it, it's truly beautiful. So thank you very much for inviting me here and, and, and whatnot. So as Christy said, uh, I am going to talk about developing gas turbine engines aimed at reducing the carbon footprint. So this is kind of a smattering of a lot of things that we're working on. It doesn't go real deep in any one single topic. I decided to maybe make it bigger, right, and, and show you a lot of things that we're working on. Um, and and that will become clear uh, as we go on. But I'm so there's maybe a couple of things that I want you to leave here with is turbines are really hard. <laughs> they're really hard to um, improve. Uh, they're very challenging. I want you to leave here with that. I want you to leave here with, um, you know, some cool gas turbine facts that I'm going to give you. Uh, and, and sort of leave here with an idea of, hey, there is a lot to do, and this was a super exciting field to be in right now. Okay, so with that, you know, I don't think I have to make this case to everybody. I think people recognize that we're in a different world. We're worried about fossil fuels. We're worried about our climate change, and aviation is certainly a part of that. So aviation produces about 2% of the CO2 uh, emissions. All right, um, and there's a projected, you know, there's a projection that we want to fly even more. And in addition to that, electric cars, well, maybe until the more recent announcement, electric cars were becoming more popular, meaning that aviation is going to now be a bigger fraction of contributor. The, the issue here is that about 90% of the CO2 emissions comes from large aircraft, so the single aisle and the dual aisle um, uh, aircraft. So why this is important is because this is a harder problem to solve, right? So if you have the small regional aircraft, so I, I come from the middle of Pennsylvania, Penn, Penn State's in the center of the state, right? And so I have to fly somewhere to fly somewhere, all right? And so we take a lot of regional aircraft to Philly or to DC or um, LaGuardia, and, and then we fly somewhere else, right? And so those small aircraft, I think we can get there with fully electric one day, all right? But if you think about the large aircraft, the single aisle and the twin aisle, I don't think we'll ever be able to lift the amount of batteries we need to fly across the ocean, right, to, to Europe. Uh, with, with that big aircraft. Batteries are just not going to get there in my lifetime and probably not even in your lifetime as a student either. So what does that mean? That means gas turbines are going to continue to be very, very important because they are an efficient way to give you the power and the energy, energy density that you need. So I'm going to talk a little bit. Now, this is like my fun slide of gas turbines. So this is, you know, I might quiz you at the end here. All right, so, so first of all, I, you know, gas turbines do, right now, they provide 100% of the military and commercial aircraft propulsion, right? They are the engine of choice. They give us about a third of the power generation and uh, electricity, 
And then they have oil and gas applications. Those are the, and, and some marine applications. Those are the big applications for gas turbines. And, and it turns out in my space, what I work on is I work on efficient turbines and I make sure that the turbines last. In all of those cases, for all three applications, what I work on is important, right? It's not just for aviation, but it's in all of those applications. But, but today, what we're going to do is we're really going to focus on this uh, commercial aircraft propulsion and, and what we can do there. Okay, so here starts some of my fun facts. Okay, what I'm going to primarily talk about is this is a cutaway of an engine, and I'm going to talk about the hot section. So mainly what happens is the, the flow comes in, goes through a fan, goes through a high-pressure compressor or maybe a low-pressure compressor, uh, goes through the combustor, right? And then downstream of the combustor is a high-pressure turbine. That's the hottest part in the engine, okay? And that's the part that I work on, all right? And, and my students and I work on that. And so, and so it's just downstream of the combustor. And I want to point out here is that what also happens, it's important, is that some of this high-pressure air, we actually by, bypass the combustor and we feed it in the in the middle of a blade to actually cool the blade, to make sure the blade survives. Okay, here's some fun facts. Fewer than 10 countries in the world can make a cooled turbine blade. They're single crystal cast turbine blade. Fewer than 10 countries can make it. This is the really amazing one. One to five years to make a development blade. So let's say as a student you have some great new idea on cooling a turbine blade, or you want to change the shape of a turbine blade, and you want to make it using single crystal cast blades, which is how they're made. You're going to be waiting your entire degree program to get that blade, all right? And so what I'm going to talk about today, what's important is we've got to be able to go faster. And that's where additive manufacturing comes in, 3D printing. It's not ready for prime time in an engine, but it is certainly ready to use for development purposes, and so that's how we're doing it. So the other thing I want to point out is, is that generally to make one good blade in this development phase, you make 25 bad blades. So about one in 25 come out right. There are more countries in the world that can make a nuclear weapon than can make a cool turbine blade. All right? That should give you some sense of how hard this really is. So, so, so what happens here is downstream of the combustor, you know, the gas, now these temperatures are, are, are not precise, but they're kind of rough temperatures, all right? I can't tell you the real temperatures, and actually companies don't tell the real temperatures because that is their proprietary secret, right? That, that stays in their heart. So, uh, but I can roughly say that the gas coming out of the combustor is about 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So the coolant temperature that we actually take from the compressor and we bypass the combustor is 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the coolant temperature, right? The melting temperature of a blade is about 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. That in itself should make you sit up in your chair and say, I'm never flying again, right? I mean, that's incredible, right? So 2,400 degrees melting, that means that, you know, we've got, we're going in with 3,000, we're cooling it with 1,000, and we gotta, we got to be able to not melt that blade at 2,400. That means we've got to be preci precise engineers that understand how much cooling we have to install in that blade to make it survive. So if, so as another example, if you are off in your design as an engineer by just 25 degrees in, in, in mispredicting how much cooling you have, you're going to cut that blade life in half. That means you're going to have to stop the engine, you're going to have to take the blade out, and you're going to have to put a new blade in because, at, 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 you know, at a much faster rate than you would have. So normally turbine blades might be designed for somewhere around 20,000 hours. That means you only get about 10,000 hours of life on it. This is really important to aircraft, to engine companies, because there is now a new financial model. So when you fly in a plane, the amount of hours that plane is flying is called time on wing, right? Companies get paid, companies don't get paid for the engine. Companies get paid for time on wing. So when that engine's flying, Pratt & Whitney, my primary sponsor, is making a lot of money, 
All right, when that engine's not flying and it's, be take, and it's taken apart because I need to put a new turbine blade in it, they're not making any money. All right, so I think that's important to understand is that business model. So a few other important facts here, and my slides quit advancing. A few other important turbine facts. Ah, oh, sorry. Sorry, there's, this is a Penn State special here. Okay, there we go. All right. Well, I think. I am so sorry. I'm going to have to do this again. Uh. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So we've already talked about the fact that it takes about three years to make a blade, and one in 25 is successful. Here's another important fact. A single blade, as it spins in an engine, the amount of thermal stress that blade has to withstand equates to hanging an entire aircraft off one blade. That's pretty, pretty amazing. We know already that the flow temperatures are high. They're high enough to melt rocks. The other thing is, is that one blade produces, if you turn the heat transfer in, that heat transfer to electricity, it produces power for 18 homes. So these are truly amazing, right, turbine blades. So, yeah, so the other thing to remember that we're working on is that a 1% increase in efficiency of that turbine equates to a reduction in 100 gallons per hour of fuel, right, or about a ton of carbon dioxide per hour, carbon dioxide emissions. So that's a, that's a pretty big deal. These are big, big numbers. Okay, so, all right, with that in mind, what, what we work on here then, as I said, is we are in the high pressure turbine. So we talked already a little bit about this idea that some of the flow doesn't go through the combustor. It turns out about roughly about 70 to 75 percent of the flow that comes into the core goes through the turbine, I mean through, through the combustor and through the blades, whereas 25 to 30 percent go to cool the blades. That's a parasitic loss, right? So that means from a thermodynamic perspective, if I got rid of all that cooling and I could just go straight through, my efficiency of an engine would be much higher. But what would also happen is my blades would burn, right? So that's, that's the trade-off. The trade-off is between efficiency and what we call is durability. All right, so what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to talk a little bit about my research lab, which is a one-stage turbine lab. Uh, and, and talk, give you a little bit of an introduction to that. I'm going to talk then about two kind of different studies that we've talked, that we've been working on. This one's really been interesting, and it's about an operator of a turbine, and I'll, I'm, I'll just leave it at that. But we're going to talk about how the, where the turbine is operated, and by what pilot, uh, and, and how that impacts the overall turbine. And then what we're doing in terms of uh, the future, in terms of researching ways to reduce carbon emissions. Okay, so this is my lab. We are a um, Pratt & Whitney Center of Excellence in Turbine Aerodynamics and Heat Transfer. And what we see here is one section of it. This is, this is the turbine rig. So this is a burner where flow comes through. And I'm going to show another picture of this in a minute. Flow comes through goes through the one-stage turbine, goes through this donut thing, turns around and goes back up out the roof. The section we're interested in is, is right here, right? That's a vein and a blade, all right? And it's a one-stage turbine. We put actual turbine hardware in there. So just like the turbine engine hardware, we put it in there. We do not operate at the temperatures and pressures that uh, an engine operates because if we did, we couldn't measure anything, all right? So we're not... We're not showing, we're, we don't have the combustor, we don't have the compressor of the engine, we only have the turbine section of the engine. And so we can operate at scaled conditions, and you all remember from fluid mechanics that, bio, that you know, Reynolds number stuff, the Mach number, you know, the similitude, Mr. Um, Buckingham, all those numbers, we match, right? But we operate at much at scaled conditions, which gives us a huge opportunity. So our focus is, obviously, we use engine-relevant hardware, to look at, um, we look at efficiency and we look at durability. 
We are a test bed for instrumentation developing, and I'm going to show you some pretty cool instrumentation today. Uh, we look at all kinds of advanced manufacturing methods for turbine parts, not just 3D metal printing, but there's lots of other advanced manufacturing methods that we look at. And then we are always looking at integrating sensors using additive manufacturing in particular so we can make measurements in places that people couldn't make measurements before. So we built this lab. We started building this lab in 2011. And, and that's how we, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm having all kinds of PowerPoint issues today. Uh, we started building this lab in 2011. Uh, really, we didn't even have the building at the time. Um, and in about 2015, we started getting our first data, which is pretty fast for building a brand new turbine lab. We started building the lab, we, we started getting data, and, and, and these are our successes thus far. There's two things I want to point out on this slide that I think are important. One is, is that um, we started to play around with this 3D metal printing in 2016. And the reason we did that is because we knew, or I knew, that I was really going to have to be able to produce turbine blades much faster. And, and so that's why um, I started playing around with additive manufacturing to, so we'd be able to do that. And so what you see here is that was sort of this bottom thing. Well, the end of the story is December of last year was the first time ever in the world that an additive cool, a cooled additive blade was spun in any kind of research lab. There was one blade spun at Siemens. They will not tell you how long it spun. And let me tell you, ours spun for months at a time because we, we did a lot of experiments. But we were able to actually show that we could 3D metal print a blade and we could spin it at 10,000 RPM in our, in our lab. And that was a huge accomplishment. The other accomplishment I want to talk about, because I'll talk a little bit about that, is a program called NEXT. It's the National Experimental Turbine. And what, we, what happened is, is when we built our lab, we went in a partnership between Pratt & Whitney, the Department of Energy, and Penn State. And that's what we built the lab. We went in with $5 million, thinking it was going to be a $5 million lab. It was a $20 million lab. Um, <laughs> we were off the, by the numbers a little bit. But, um, you know, our, our sponsors kept, kept feeding us money until we got it built up. And, and so, but what we had in there was a Pratt & Whitney proprietary turbine. And we wanted to be bigger than just Pratt & Whitney. We wanted to look at some of our own cooling technologies, and we wanted to be able to attract some other companies. So Penn State was funded by the Department of Energy to develop this turbine test bed called NEXT the National Experimental Turbine. And that's what this bottom graphic is. And these are the companies. So we got Pratt & Whitney, Solar Turbine, Siemens Energy, and Honeywell all to go together and design a turbine. And it's really a Penn State proprietary turbine, but we are able to um, use it for our, for, our, for our testing purposes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some work from that. <laughs> All right, so let me talk a little bit more about this facility. So this is the facility. So we have two large compressors, off-the-shelf compressors. We don't have a tr tr traditional compressor. These two compressors um, produce about 25 pounds per second of air. They feed into a burner. Students like to put my little picture here so you can get scale. Okay, the flow comes in. Some of the flow is siphoned off and goes to cool the turbine blades, and then the rest of the flow goes through the turbine. And so that's what the facility looks like. Two of our, I would say, very unique measurement capabilities are, one is to be able to map turbine blades with an infrared camera. What you're looking at here is a video, and you can see the blade. In a minute, I'm going to take away the blade, and you're going to see the upstream vein. We pull out one of the veins. We push in a, another vein that contains an infrared probe which can then um, make the thermal measurements, IR measurements, on the downstream vein. We get those measurements, and then we map it onto the blade. Now, to give you some appreciation on this, those blades are spinning 500, uh, about 500 miles an hour, right? And we're able to capture any single blade. We can lock onto any single blade we want. We can lock onto it. We can do an average. And I'm going to show you a video in a minute of how that looks. That is one of our measurement techniques. We can, we can detect with this camera 
the full blade mapping, so we can get a full thermal picture of the blade. In addition, we can tell Pratt & Whitney, you used a different manufacturing method to make this hole. So we have resolution good enough to see cooling holes that are on the order of 0 0.015 inches in diameter. So that's pretty small, right? So that's one of our really powerful measurement techniques. The other measurement technique that we have is downstream of this, we have a full 360 traverse. Now, what, what good is that? These are pressures. This is a pressure map, I think, or temperature map, one of the two. We can measure all the way. There, there's a 360 degree traverse sitting right there. And we can measure all the pressures and temperatures all the way around. The reason we have to do that is we want to get very accurate stage thermodynamic efficiency. We have a torque meter. We have a dynamometer. We can measure the power output. But those measurements also have other effects that you can't account for. So we want very accurate measurements. And to do that, you need to measure all the way around the, the wheel in terms of pressure and temperature. You integrate it, and then you get a good thermodynamic efficiency, stage efficiency. So this is what, um, if you're looking in the, if you're sitting in our control room watching data, this is what you see on the IR camera. I wanted to illustrate this because I think it's pretty cool. You see the blades passing and you see a bunch of noise. What we've done now is we've locked onto one blade. Now we've done time averaging. So you can see the time averaging happening as a, on one blade. And you can see the cooling features, right? And this happens to be up in that corner of the blade. So you can now see what we're going to do in a minute. We're going to take the probe and we're going to sweep over. We can see the blade behind it. Uh, and so, you know, we can have some kind of movement of the probe, which is good. Uh, and then we can also, in a minute, you're going to see another pattern here. We've locked onto a different blade. So this is one particular blade, and now we've locked onto another blade. This blade happens to have this feature in it, which is important because that's a fiducial mark that allows us to then take that image and do an accurate mapping onto the blade itself. So these are some other results, which I think is important. And, and I talked about this stage efficiency. And you may doubt, like, do you really have to measure all the way around the wheel to get a good thermodynamic efficiency? So this is uh, thermodynamic efficiency plotted as uh, um, a circumferential position around, around the wheel. So what this data shows is that, in fact, if we only measured 10 degrees around the blade, we could get this much difference in our, in our measurement of efficiency, right? And so you can see that as you, as you start to go all the way around the wheel, right, this starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's because that is then the, a more accurate level of efficiency. I'll tell you, this is not an easy measure to make. <laughs> you may think, oh, we just go around the wheel, but you have to think about it. That means we're traversing all those cables, the pressure and temperature cables, around the wheel with us which is a real challenge to do. But um, this is, and, and again, what we're trying to eke out is an understanding of just a 1% thermal efficiency, which makes a huge difference, as we talked about in my, in my slide a couple of slides ago, in terms of efficiency. So this is kind of what we do. And this, this shows an example of the kind of data we get. This is a nominal cooling flow coming out of the blade. This is a low cooling flow out of the blade. This is pressure. And this is temperature. And you can see the differences in the overall pattern downstream, right? And those then equate, we actually integrate those, as I said, to get the overall thermal efficiency. So this is an example. The, the, here is some data that we have. And so what we're plotting here, and you, you'll see that I can never give you real numbers because I can't give you real numbers. OK, but I can give you reference numbers, right? So this is an efficiency minus some kind of reference efficiency that we made for this particular case. So as you increase cooling flow to your blade, what happens? Efficiency goes down, right? Because now we're taking more of that flow and we're not passing it through the blade anymore, the hot gas path. We're actually just using it to cool the blade. So you see that it's decreasing as we increase the cooling flow. And it depends on where you put the cooling flow. So sometimes we put flow through the blade. Sometimes we have to do a purge flow. And the purge flow is there to make sure no hot gas goes underneath the platform. 
And in both of these cases, there, these are parasitic losses, thermodynamic losses that actually hurt the engine performance. So if we can improve our cooling and use less cooling flow and still maintain blade life, that's a big deal. The other thing I'll point out is in, the, in another case, you see, these, um, you see these yellow symbols up here. And what happens in this case is that we're actually changing the tip gap the gap between the blade and the outer casing. The gap between the blade and the outer casing in actual engine operations can be measured on the order of a couple of paper thicknesses. Imagine that. You're running on an engine. The thing's spinning at 30,000, 40,000 RPM, and it's going by that outer casing with a gap that's only a couple of papers thin a couple of papers thick, whatever. It's very, very small. So, so you're saying, OK, you got all these problems. What can you really do? And we talked a little bit about this, is that if you reduce the blade cooling flow, we can increase efficiency. The way a blade is typically cooled, there's a lot of internal cooling. So blades have, are incredible heat exchangers. They're the best heat exchangers we have. They have pin fins at the end, they have um, uh, ribs and turbulators and all kinds of crazy stuff going on, on the inside, and then there's film cooling on the outside, right? And those are the typical cooling um, techniques that we use. But there's a lot of others, right? So there's things that we can do in terms of end wall shaping. So early on in my career, probably my biggest accomplishment is that I came up with a fillet on the front end of a, a turbine vane. If you look at the F-35 military engine today, you'll see a fillet on there. And it's a patent held by me and a couple of people at Pratt & Whitney. And we actually modeled it after a um, dorsal fin on a shark. Kind of cool, right? So there's still plenty of things to do. And that, that helps reduce the aerodynamic losses in that case. There's also something called double wall cooling, where you can put a cooling film in between the wall OK, this is really exciting. It's really challenging to make. But it's very exciting because now you've brought the coolant flow even closer to the external wall of the surface of the blade, and that's some of your best cooling. We can also think about lots of different shape channels and, and so forth for cooling. So there's, there's pl the point I want to make here is there's plenty of stuff to do to drive this line up to higher efficiency so we can use lower cooling. Then we get into different materials. Ceramic matrix composites are big. So again, by reducing the amount of cooling, that, by, by changing the temperature of the metal, rather than you know, using single crystal cast metal, we can actually use ceramic matrix composites. And in those cases, we can also reduce the amount of cooling that we need. And then finally, I'll, I'll talk about this is the, the blade tip design. So as you change your tip gap and you make it even smaller, you get, a, you get an improvement in efficiency. So can we change the geometry of the tip? And that's what one of my students is working on now, is changing the geometry of the tip to maybe change the geometry so you don't get much flow over that tip. And that actually helps increase the efficiency. So that's a, real big, a really big area that we're working on in, in our lab. And then also, just to make sure that we all the flow underneath, we never have hot gas going underneath. And we always have to re, re, we use um, coolant flow to actually reduce that from happening. And so that's a, also kind of a challenge. So this is one of the things that my student is working on. So again, this is, this is thermodynamic efficiency. This is for a tip gap. And this is looking at two different tips, a flat tip on the blade, or what they call as a squealer tip, all right? And you can see that, you know, as, that, as you increase that tip gap, the gap between the outer casing and the blade, there's a pretty significant reduction in efficiency. Um, but you see that in this case, the squealer tip much, does much better. We're working on things beyond the squealer tip. Squealer tips are used to, in today's engines, but we're working on, you know, the next thing. So let me now switch gears a little bit. So I think I've maybe convinced you there's more stuff to do on turbines. We can, we can eke out more efficiency, 
right? There's, there's places to go and things we can do. I want to talk now a little bit about what happens in practice. So it turns out that, you know, there's lots of different, you know, th there's things on paper, and then there's things that, you know, really happen, right? And so one of the things is that is a very big problem that is um, hurting our industry today is dirt and dust in the engine. And you probably read from time to time these things about, you know, airplane engines being grounded in India, air indigo, right, not being able to fly their planes. Uh, that is happening because planes are flying even at 36,000 feet are getting dirt and dust particles in the engine that is clogging up the film cooling, clogging up the cooling holes, clogging up the passages, and just depositing on blades. And that's a bad day, okay? I do a lot of dirt and dust testing. I, I don't enjoy it because it's so negative. <laughs> but let me tell you, it has a huge impact. But one of the programs that we worked on this past year, which was pretty interesting, it was a NASA-funded program. Our partner was Pratt & Whitney. And what they did is they got turbine blades from different engines around the world with different pilots who had used those engines for different amounts of time. And we were able to get those blades. And I can't show you the full picture of the blade, OK, for proprietary reasons. But I can show you a little snippet of what the blades looked like. This was what I would call baseline blade. This was a pretty new blade, OK? So kind of what the surface looked like. This was operator one. And I can't even tell you the airline, because they'll, they'll get mad if I tell you the airline or the or, or too much or what part of the world they were operated in. But this was a benign, what I would call benign operator. You know, maybe one that was theoretically could have been flying over the US, theoretically, OK? Um, operator two was, uh, so this was, we're going to call this a delta T of one. This one was operated at about 40% of the amount of time this one was operated in a very different region of the world. Now, already, you can probably tell this is bad, not so good, right? Uh, and then this is operator two, which was 75% of the time, and it was pretty harsh conditions, OK, and what the surface looked like. So we got all these blades, and we did what we call a rainbow test, rain rainbow wheel test. We put all those blades in a single stage, and we put them in our turbine, and we took our infrared camera, and we looked at what kind of blade temperatures these blades were going to have. And so that's, that's what we did. The first thing we noticed is that we, we actually flow tested all the blades, OK? And you can see operator one, operator two, and operator three, all right? And you can see that, you know, the operator one, um, and this is relative to the benign blade, right? So that's, that's the baseline. And you can see operator one, they, none of them got to 100% of the flow. So already, you got a problem. You're not getting as much cooling flow through those blades. Because a, because a turbine operates with a constant pressure source, a constant pressure inlet supply, and a constant pressure exit. So if you've got hole blockage or if you've got channel blockage, and you've got the same delta P, you're going to get less flow through the blade, right? And so you can see that in some cases, we're not, we're not getting as much flow through the blade in this case. This graph, and you'll, you'll notice I have no y-axis on here because I'm not allowed to publish my y-axis. But here's what you can think about. This is the trailing edge of a blade, and this is kind of the leading edge of a blade. And these are temperature traces, essentially. The temperature trace that is near this line means that this is, the, this is what we would have expected for the design of that blade. So a, a blade that wasn't operated under harsh conditions. But you can see all of these blades, the temperature fell below what that line was. And what does that mean? The blade was operating much hotter than it, than it was designed to operate. OK, so what does that mean in terms of life? I, OK, and so these are like these are average temperatures, 
for the blades. So I'll, 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 I'll go to the punchline here. The punchline is this is relative life. So again, turbine blades are designed maybe to uh, operate for, you know, 20,000 hours, all right? And so, and they're, op they're, you know, operating at a certain temperature for 20,000 hours. So it means that this curve is what they expect over time for a blade to operate. And in fact, what we're seeing is for the blades that we tested, it all fell below the line. Again, that, what that means is we got to tear the engine down and we got to replace the parts much sooner than we would have if we had been operating in the expected lifetime. All right. And so, so this is saying that, you know, this was bad. And this was actually quite surprising because in some cases, this, you know, some cases it didn't go with the amount of time, but it went with the region and the particular airline that was operating the turbine. Some pilots are a little bit more aggressive than other pilots, okay? Some regions of the world are harder to fly in than others. Okay, so let's talk about now maybe something positive, and, and this is a, another program that we're working on, and, and this has to do with how can we get to sustainable aviation, all right? How, what can we do? This is a program we're working on. And so what the point of this slide is, is that there's kind of four buckets of solutions, right? Um, and, and so there's sustainable aviation fuel. You've all heard of that, right? And that looks very positive, but we haven't proven to ourselves that we can make enough fuel yet, all right? That's, that's the tough part, is being able to make all the fuel that we need. Thing is, is we need a turbine to operate that fuel. The second thing is we can use hydrogen as a fuel. There's a lot of challenges with that on aviation. But again, we're still going to need a turbine. The third solution is hybrid electric, so like a Prius flying through a sky, or in my case, I have a, a, a RAV4 Prime, right, um, flying through the sky. Um, and, and so again, though, you still need a turbine. And then the last one is fully electric. And we already talked about for the big planes, we're not going to have enough battery power to be able to do a, a fully electric. So the point is that in three of these cases, we need a turbine. And in all of these cases, as turbine efficiency increases, we can actually reduce the size of the turbine because we don't need as much power. But what happens then? As you reduce the size of the turbine, unfortunately, the efficiency goes down. So that's bad because not everything scales down. You still have these manufacturing features you have to deal with. You still have cooling holes you can't make any smaller because you need dust and dirt to be able to go through the cooling holes. So those cooling holes now become relatively larger relative to your turbine blade. NASA's goal is to get a turbine blade, you know, the size of a dime. Right now, turbine blades are about an inch, inch and a half in the high pressure turbine. All right. So we're really talking about something very small. But if you look at what happens as a, as a function of efficient, as you bring the core size down, this is, you can do some ideal thermodynamic scaling. But what happens, in fact, and this is data, the, the turbine efficiency goes way down and drops off. So our goal is in this particular project of looking at a hybrid configuration. My, my team is working on also bringing the size of the turbine down. And that's what we're working on right now. This is a project. It's a NASA ULI, which is a university leadership initiative program. We're working with Georgia Tech, Howard University, Pratt & Whitney, and Collins. And we're looking at both a system optimization as well as a component optimization. And, and this is what we're doing. So this is, might be what the schematic looks like in terms of hooking a battery to a gas turbine. Uh, Georgia Tech is actually looking at all of the system optimization. So how much should we do with the hybrid? So you can think about using the hybrid in an interesting way, right? You can say, well, when I take off, I need a lot of power. So I'm going to draw power from the gas turbine, and I'm going to draw power from the battery. But when I'm at cruise, I probably don't need the battery. I'll just operate the turbine like a constant power output, right? And so if you operate it as a constant power po output, as opposed to having to go through transients, you can design the turbine differently. 
And so that becomes pretty exciting as well. And so those are some of the things we're working at. Howard University is working with us on looking at some of the creep fatigue assessment for AM alloys. We're heavily into AM, as I talked about, primarily because we want to go faster. And then Georgia Tech is doing a clean sheet combustor design. So a brand new, thinking about combustors differently and maybe merging the combustors and the turbine a little bit closer and making it lightweight and smaller. Okay, so I, I, I've, I've, one of the big pieces, and this is the theme here is, is this manufacturing thing, right? So I wanted to illustrate this by, by going through this. So in 2017, we started with a new blade design. We're now 2023, we're in the final machining stages of a brand new development blade. This illustrates how long this takes. Look at all the companies we had to work with because of all the steps to make a single crystal cast blade with cooling. This is ridiculous. Okay, this is, this is hard, really hard. If we make it with additive, just for development purposes, not for the engine, we started a program in about 2020 with the design, and we have already tested it in 2022. And, and we, we tested it, right? And that was our first case. There's another thing called rapid casting, where you're now using additive to make the tools to make that single crystal blade. And when you do that, Look at how this is shortened up. This is now in a, in a year time frame. This is huge. This is really huge. We've been operating in very slow speeds, and now we're much faster. But even with additive, you can't just make a blade, right? You, you don't just hit print. OK, give me the drawing, hit print. The, it, these are, this is still not perfect. There's some science to this 3D metal printing yet, for sure. Our experience says you have to try it at least three times to figure out the orientation of printing before you, in fact, get a, a good one. And, and, and some of it has to do with, and this illustrates the science of it, okay? This, was, this is a data, this is an optical scan of samples we just took in the last three months. These are different companies with different materials, Carpenter, Oak Ridge, a company called Vertex, and a company, and this is SIMP3D. We have our own additive manufacturing center of excellence. These are different materials. There's a cobalt, a nickel alloy, Inconel 718, which is the most common material, and then there's a Hastex, which is another common material. This is a coupon that we made. It's a coupon containing pin fins, and this is an optical scan of what it looks like on the pins. Look at that surface topology. Is that like amazing? Same part. As a matter of fact, they all built it in the same orientation. What do you think that might be, might do to your heat transfer? You're gonna get very different results, right? And so, so that's, these are the things that we're still, things are not ready for prime time with even 3D metal printing. There's still very, very much work to do. If we look at the roughness levels, you know, this is the external roughness. This is where cast blades are, and this is a, a surface roughness in microns, okay? This is where cast is. This is where 3D metal printing is, okay? This is the trailing edge where the metal is really thin. You get very, very high roughness levels, and then you get lower roughness levels near the leading edge where the blade is thicker. Um, and, and so, and also you can see this on, on, on this one. This is the internal side, or sorry, this is the external side. This is the internal side of a blade. The external side you can do post-processing and machining, but the internal side of the blade, you can't do much with it, right? Because you got pin fins and everything else. You can't put a slurry through it and, and make it smooth. It's really, comp it's really difficult. So is this important? Well, what we've been looking at is saying, all right, we, we did our, our mini digital twin. Okay, but it's a mini digital twin. We actually took a, a turbine vane. We know what it was supposed to do. We built it using additive manufacturing, and then we um, light scanned it, blue light scanned it, so we got like the exact part. And we then averaged all those parts into one average part, did a CFD analysis, 
And then we actually did a CFD analysis of the as-built vein, the full ring. All right? It makes a huge difference. So it, this is the pressure distribution around the vein, the pressure side and the suction side. And you can see the design intent is the nice red line. You can see our data points here. You can see the green line, which is the as-built vein ring, which you're getting closer to. And then you can see the average as-built. And that actually shows up kind of the best when compared to the data. The point is, is that you can't just build something. You have to do some analysis with it as well. This is our, our first thermal image of our additive blade. OK, so this gives you an idea of what that data looks like when we IR image the, the blade in our next blade. And that's what the CFD prediction is. Not quite perfect. Not quite perfect. Again, manufacturing is important. So this is, a, this is what the cooling, the range of cooling you get downstream of a cooling, range of cooling holes, just because you can never make a perfect cooling hole. And look at that range. It's a pretty big range. That in a real turbine translates to many tens of degrees difference. OK, pretty big, pretty big deal. OK, my very second to last slide is the fact that I, I want to show you what we're doing at Penn State. This is exciting. We have our existing facility that you see here. We're actually more than doubling our footprint. We're building onto a facility in the next three to five years where we're adding a second turbine line and four more compressors because a girl can't have enough compressors. OK, we add, we're adding a second turbine line, which is a two-stage turbine, which will be a small core. And that's where we're heading. That's about a $25 million addition to our lab. And we're, we're super excited and super thankful to have the support of FAA and the Department of Energy and Pratt & Whitney to build that. OK, so this is the end of my talk, except I have to show you one more with my students. But I think what I've tried to emphasize here is there's much more to do in terms of efficiency of a turbine. They're not just, it's just not old stuff. There's plenty more to do. There's much research that's needed. I think what's important is, is that, you know, I think what I hope you come away from this is not all turbines can operate the same in different regions of the world. I'm quite scared. I know, you know, I'm quite scared to get on turbines or get on a plane in some regions. It's, it's um, you know, pretty dramatic. And then the fact that there's a lot of potential with additive manufacturing, but in fact, um, yeah, in fact, <laughs> but it, you know, there's a lot of potential, but it's still not an exact science. This is a, a shameless plug. If you're an undergraduate and you're interested in spending a summer in State College, we have an REU on, um, on propulsion and power generation, low, low carbon aviation. And so I'd, I'd you know, be very happy to, to have you here. And then I'll end, you, I'll end with one very kind of funny slide. This was the Halloween in our lab. Our students gave tours to over 100 people from the Department of Energy and from our um, many industry friends. And they decided that they would dress up like me. All right? And so each one of them, including this guy with the skirt here, dressed up. And I can tell you that every one of these outfits is an outfit that I have in my closet, <laughs> unbelievably. And the other piece of it is that and Christy probably knows this, they're all carrying a can of Diet Coke because I drink a lot of Diet Coke. So that was the tour. All right, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll send a, I'll have a real picture um, of our group. And with that, I'll, I'll take and try to answer any questions you might have in the next, in the next few minutes. And I want to thank you for your attention. And hopefully, I inspired you to come work in turbines because there's plenty to do. Yeah, I mean, really what happens is, is that we don't need as much power from the turbine, OK? So you can make them smaller. And it comes down to weight, weight reduction, which is very big, right? So that, that is the idea, to shrink the turbine um, and make it more efficient, more compact, 
and be able to, um, you know, carry less weight. That's a big part of it. Good question. Yep. Um, I saw kind of competing trade-offs between uh, additive manufacturing has a good way of trying new things fast, but it's not helping you with efficiency versus keep using normal manufacturing to get that efficiency. Like, are they two, are they competing or not? Like, could you isolate the two tracks? Yeah, I'm not sure they're competing. Um, I think what I tried to express is the fact that um, this is, as with aviation, we move slowly, right? I mean, we might work on something and we might see it in the field 20 years later. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's very hard to make stuff and it's hard to make turbine blades. And so even if you have an idea of like a new cooling geometry and you want to test it in a real blade, it can be four years before you could actually do that test. Whereas what we can do with AM is we can test it faster and get a good idea of, hey, you know what, this has potential. Let's go make this in a real cast blade but we can do a down select. So it's just kind of like, you know, we all do rapid prototyping with plastic parts, right? And you can down, you know, you can test it or you can see how it looks and then you can make the real part. And so it's the same in terms of using metal additive manufacturing. Let's just make parts and see if we can test them to get an idea of if this is better or not. The question is that maybe, that maybe you're, you're, I was trying to express. The question is, is, is there a true back-to-back -back between CAST and AM? It means that if we come up with the answer with AM and we say, hey, this really did work better, does, is that really going to apply to a CAST part? That's an area of research. It is very hard, let me just say this, it's very hard to do a back-to-back -back comparison. And we're trying, I keep saying we're going to do that in our next program, in our next, in our, the following program we're working on, but it never quite works because you make a part differently for cast than you make it with AM. You have to keep the AM process in mind when you're making a part. You can put cooling technologies in there, but you, you're still going to design it a little bit differently than if you design it for a, a single crystal cast because, because of the way that they're made. Right? So it's never quite easy where there's a back-to-back -back comparison. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, in the additive manufacturing, how do you uh, kind of overcome the overhang like geometry of the channels? Yeah, you don't. Yeah, it's, there. it's there. But it's getting better. I, I didn't show you pictures of that, but you know, we had the, we had the, um, we had the blade made for next and we you know inside the blade are small small features such as um, trip strips they call them or ribs those ribs actually look pretty good even though you know there there there's overhang right there, there's not a support holding the rib there when you make it and so it's it's pretty good so the the trick is when you make an AM part which I think you're getting to which is an important point that's why you have to go through all those trials if you have to figure out the orientation and you have to figure out the where to put the supports. And once you kind of nail those two down and you optimize it, then you can get a, a pretty good part. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So besides like integrated cooling channels and all that complex geometry that you can put into AM parts versus traditionally machined ones, like how do you see the design for additive manufacturing changing the way we shape, like, the, the general turbine shape hasn't changed. Like you're just using AM as a different manufacturing process versus like, but AM, the design space in AM is so much- Wider. Uh, yeah, it's wider. There's more degrees of freedom you have access to. Um, so I guess, are you doing in your own research like of changing the shape of the- We have done place? tons of that. And that, that's a whole nother three or four seminars. I can't tell you, I, one day when I retire, I have, I have, you know those little coupons I showed? I have. I have closets of coupons because I have creative students who want to try all kinds of things. And they have tried all kinds of geometries and printed, and, and actually, not necessarily for turbines, but for heat exchangers. 
So uh, we are now getting a lot of funding from companies who want to look at heat exchanger designs because, you know, it, there's a lot of possibilities there. And we have a ton of different geometries we have looked at that and some of them I think are quite valuable for the heat exchanger companies. But I just want to point out, you know, I want to make sure, you know, you understand that, you know, you can't just take an additive part and put it in a turbine of today, especially one that is a, you know, the, you know, the turbines I've been talking about today. That for the power generation turbines, maybe for the second stage, there are some, there are some AM parts being made because the temperatures are lower and they can withstand the heat and the temperatures. So I don't want you to leave here thinking, oh, we're going to 3D print tur turbine blades, because that's, that's not really where we're at yet. Yeah? How much would the efficiency of a gas turbine increase if you didn't have to use any film cooling air and you take the full adiabatic flame temperature yeah. coming out of the combustor? OK, a lot. Is that a good answer? <laughs> I can't, I can't say, I can't say how much because it's a little comp. It's the, I think the answer is a little bit more complicated than that because there are still some losses, you know, with tip, you know, with the tip geometries and and gaps and all of those features that actually are losses. So there's not, there's not a. I guess the theoretical limit is just the theoretical limit for a Brayton cycle, right? That would be the theoretical. But I don't think you will ever reach that because there's still other losses. But if you didn't have to use the cooling, I, I showed those, they're, they're big, right? They're big numbers if you can reduce the amount of cooling in terms of what we could do to improve efficiency. That's why the CMCs, I know you have a different approach, but the CMCs are a, are a big deal. The ceramic matrix composites, because that allows us to go to higher temperatures. And so people say, well, if you go to CMCs, you don't have to do cooling anymore. And then people will say, well, why not? Let's, because then we can go to higher turbine inlet temperatures. So even with CMCs, we're still talking about cooling the CMC blades and veins. Yeah. Um, so even within Metal AM, there's like separate technologies. Have you evaluated like the difference in efficiencies you get with like a powder bed fusion part versus an e-beam part? No. So we strictly use laser powder bed fusion for the reason being is that if you want to get your part anywhere close to design intent because the features are so small that we we have to use laser powder bed one of the things i didn't mention is that by the way is that this laser powder bed fusion is not ready at all for making cooling holes you know the small holes they're terrible looking they're terrible and, and so we still do conventional electro discharge machining to make the small holes um, because it, it, going back to the overhang thing, right, when you have a cooling hole and it's unsupported, you, you just get a crappy looking hole. And so we will, we will use conventional methods do, to do those. You had a question, yeah. Should the design process be modified to incorporate different flight conditions? Say it again. Uh, should the design procedure of like making a turbine blade be modified according to the flight conditions in which such a specific engine has to fly, or would that just make it more complex? Well, I mean, I think you know. I mean, I don't think planes just fly in one country, right? You know, we we fly around, <laughs> okay? So I don't think we can. I don't think we can support a fleet that only has engines for a particular country. Right, even like, for example, I mean, like I mentioned Air Indigo as a, you know, I think Air Indigo flies outside of India, for example. So I don't think you can, you can do that quite. That would be pretty hard to do. Yeah. What will the CFD model they have in the design and optimization process? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it does. I showed that one plot and that we're trying to go in parallel with it. So oftentimes, in my industry, CFD is done for optimization purposes, right? And, and to start looking at, you know, optimization of a cooling hole geometry or whatnot. And then I would say still, if my industry really depends on tests and tests at different levels. So lower technology readiness level, like a low testing level, and then it keeps going up from there and like our our rig is testing things at a TRL of about 
depending, four to six, depending on what we're testing. So, I, you know, CFD is not hitting a lot of stuff. Yeah, do people understand why? Like what is missing from the models? I think in my, my understanding of it, and I'm not a full CFD person, but in talking to companies and based on the experience, because we do do some CFD, a lot of it has to do with boundary conditions. Where do you set the boundary conditions? Because even if you look at a turbine stage, do you set the boundary condition, like do I have to model the combustor? How do I model the cooling flow coming to the blade? All of those boundary conditions make it challenging. Yeah. So uh, um, different manufacturers, engine manufacturers have different ideas about rotor blades and stator blades. So like uh, sometimes they have different shapes. So like do you play with them having different combinations of rotor and stator blades? Or is it like you have fixed the fixed blades and then you're just experimenting with uh, the rotor blades? No, we, comp we play with both, I would say, yeah. I mean, we've, we've done both. Like, does that affect, uh, affect the efficiency? Yeah, it, well, so, you know, I'll give you just one simple example. So there is a turbine vein and blade we could make that optimizes the efficiency of the engine, but has higher heat transfer so the part doesn't last as long. That's the trade-off. That's generally the trade-off. I can make a turbine blade and vein that has a very favorable temperature distribution around it so I could last longer, hurts on efficiency, right? So that's, there's just this constant battle between these two groups. And they're, and they're two different groups at Pratt & Whitney and they're always at battle. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It seems like based on the chart, and obviously the scale is like probably proprietary or whatever, but there was a pretty big difference between what was expected and what was um, actually performing um, because of accumulation of like dust and stuff. Um, has it been tried or is it even like remotely like worth testing to put some sort of like mild like acid or stripping agent like in the flow that goes through the center of the blade to try to just like work some of that stuff out like just during the cycle of the engine or? This stuff is melted on to the blade. We've tested these parts actually at real temperatures and put dirt through them. Not in our rig. I won't allow dirt and dust in my star rig, but we have other um, little smaller tests that we run. We've run a lot of dirt and dust tests. And let me tell you, that stuff is, it's on there and it ain't coming off. <laughs> I mean, it, because it's melted. It's, it's, it's melted onto the part. Yeah. Okay, we'll give you a few minutes after five. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you all very much for your attention.